Hello Cortmore, I'm hoping you're enjoying the lovely weather. This week I'm going to read a bit of a book called White Teeth by Zadie Smith. Now it's a book that I read at university which is a very long time ago. Um, I remember loving it but I haven't really seen it or read it, read it since. It's very relevant to everything that's happening at the moment in terms of Black Lives Matter and in terms of um, increasing our understanding and awareness of other cultures. So I thought it was a really relevant one to think about this week. I'm going to do it in a bit of a reciprocal read style. Obviously, I have read it, but it was a very long time ago. So really, I'm coming at it quite new. So on the back, it tells me that it deals with, among many other things, friendship, love, war, three cultures and three families over three generations, one brown mouse and the tricky way the past has of coming back and biting you on the ankle. It is a life-affirming riotous must-read of a book. So I'm really interested to see then what's inside, reminding myself, obviously first time for most of you I would say. So I'm going to look at the contents page first and the contents page is really interesting. So I've obviously got these three families. I've got Archie, 1974, 1945. So I'm already questioning why the later date comes first. Then I've got Samad, 1984, 1857. So that can't all be about one person called Samad because that would mean he'd lived for over 130 years. Then I've got Irie, 1990 to 1907. So again, the later date's coming first. But then I've got Majid, Millet and Marcus. So I've gone from having just a single person to having three people all together. And then their dates are 1992, 1999. So that's a little bit maybe more what I was expecting about it. So let's start off. I'm just going to read you a bit of Archie. We'll just have a think about Archie. Um, and then hopefully some of you will then get it out of the library, have a look and see what you think and let us know. So Archie, 1974, 1945. Every little trifle, for some reason, does seem incalculably important today. And when you say of a thing that nothing hangs on it, it sounds like blasphemy. There's never any knowing. How am I to put it? Which of our actions, which of our idlenesses won't have things hanging on it forever? And that's a quotation for Where Angels Fear to Tread by Ian e. Forster. So chapter one, the peculiar second marriage of Archie Jones. Early in the morning, late in the century, why do I need to know that? Cricklewood Broadway, so I'm assuming that's the place. At 06, 27 hours on 1st of January 1975, Alfred Archibald Jones was dressed in corduroy and sat in a fume-filled Cavalier Musketeer estate, face down on the steering wheel, hoping the judgment would not be too heavy upon him. He lay forward in a prostrate cross, jaw slack, arms splayed either side like some fallen angel. Scrunched up in each fist, he held his army service medals, left, and his marriage licence, right, for he had decided to take his mistakes with him. So I'm getting the impression that Archie's trying to um, commit suicide, which is a, a not a particularly nice way to start a story. But there's some interesting facts about it. Why is he choosing to do it on New Year's Day, which is obviously normally like a first, you know, the first day of a new start, a new year. And then he's saying that his army service medals, which are normally something that is celebrated, is part of his mistake. So I want to know why that is as well. A little green light flashed in his eye, signalling a right turn he had resolved never to make. He was resigned to it. He was prepared for it. He had flipped a coin and stood staunchly by its conclusions. This was a decided upon suicide. In fact, it was a New Year's resolution. Well, there's the link to New Year. Still seems very strange to me. Also, if the whole section is all about Archie, then I can't imagine this suicide is going to go through with it, because otherwise how can the whole section be about him? I suppose unless it's a flashback. But even as his breathing became spasmodic and his lights dimmed, Archie was aware that Cricklewood Broadway would seem a strange choice. Strange to the first person to notice his slumped figure through the windscreen. Strange to the policemen who would refile the report. To the local journalist called upon to write 50 words. 
to the next of kin who would read them. Squeezed between an almighty concrete cinema complex at one end and a giant intersection at the other, Cricklewood was no kind of place. It was not a place a man came to die. It was a place a man came in order to go other places via the A41. But Archie Jones didn't want to die in some pleasant distant woodland or on a cliff edge fringed with delicate heather. The way Archie saw it, country people should die in the country and city people should die in the city. Only proper. In death as he was in life and all that. It made sense that Archibald should die on this nasty urban street where he had ended up living alone at the age of 47 in a one-bedroom flat above a deserted chip shop. He wasn't the type to make elaborate plans, suicide notes and funeral instructions. He wasn't the type for anything fancy. All he asked was for a bit of silence, a bit of shush so he could concentrate. He wanted it to be perfectly quiet and still like the inside of an empty confessional box or the moment in the brain between thought and speech. He wanted to do it before the shops opened. So I'm already now thinking, well, this Archie seems like a really interesting chap. He's somebody who lives in the city and he wants to die in the city. But he's also saying that he wants quiet and peace, which is definitely not something you've got in the city. He wants it to be like the inside of an empty confessional box, which implies to me that he's got some sins or something bad that he's done in his past that he is trying to atone for, to make up for. And then why does he want to do it before the shop's opened? Is he trying to kind of fade away? He's already recognised he's going to be found by quite a lot of people. It's obviously a really busy place, this sort of intersection. So all in all now, I really want to find out what happens to poor old Archie um, and whether he goes through with it, whether something happens to stop him. And then obviously the biggest point of the story then is to find out how Archie's life sort of intersects and intertwines with Samad's and Iris, and then we get Majid, Millet and Marcus. And I have to confess, even though I did read it and I did study it, it hasn't brought anything back to me, so I'm looking forward now to reading the rest of the book and re-familiarising myself with it. Thanks for listening, Courtmore. See you soon. Bye.